Okay, so thank you so much uh, for joining us at this conference organized by the Atlanta Neuroethics Consortium. For those of you who've joined us from out of town, and especially our international guests, I want to welcome you to Georgia State University and to Atlanta. Uh, I said I want to welcome y'all because I'm born and raised in Atlanta, and I can say that, but uh, I also want to say if you have any questions about anything, uh, just ask the locals. They'll answer. Even if they're not from the South, they have to be nice. Uh, so my name is Eddie Namias, and I'm a professor in the philosophy department and the Neuroscience Institute here at Georgia State. And as part of Georgia State's Second Century Initiative, I've helped to develop a neuroethics program here, which includes concentrations in neuroethics and our PhD programs in neuroscience and psychology, and which will involve two more hires of senior scholars who work on the ethics of neuroscience or the neuroscience of moral cognition. The first hire we made was a very good one. Uh, it was Nicole Vincent, who uh, will be up here shortly to describe the conference to you. Many of you already know the ball of energy that is Nicole, uh, but I want to be the first to ask us to thank her for her tremendous efforts putting together this wonderful conference. So thank you, Nicole. Uh, and I'm going to let her thank some, uh, some of the other people who have been instrumental in putting this together. Uh, I want to thank the graphic artist students who created the programs for us, their Beacon Creative Design, and uh, all of our sponsors across the four universities who made this event possible and free for you, the audience. So we have uh, members of the Atlanta Neuroethics Consortium, Emory University, their Center for Ethics, Georgia Tech, their School of Public Policy and School of Applied Physiology, and then several uh, units here at Georgia State University, Gene Bloom. Uh, Beer Blumenfeld Center for Ethics, the Center for Law, Health, and Society, the Department of Philosophy, the Neuroscience Institute, and Phi Sigma Tau. And then uh, Nicole has worked with Francis Shen uh, at the Rabina Institute of Criminal Law and Criminal Justice to co-sponsor this workshop and one they had last year. So we want to thank all those sponsors to, uh, for making this possible. Um, my only other task now is to introduce Paul Wolpe, who's going to tell us a little bit about the Atlanta Neuroethics Consortium. Paul Wolpe is, and let me take a deep breath, the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Bioethics, the Raymond Shkenazi Distinguished Research Chair in Jewish Bioethics, the professor, a professor in the Departments of Medicine, Pediatrics, Psychiatry, and Sociology, and Director of the Center for Ethics at Emory University. Uh, but behind all those impressive titles, Paul has really been a critical leader in bioethics over the past decades and more recently in helping to create the field of neuroethics. He's co-editor of the American Journal of Bioethics, AJOB, and creator and editor of AJOB Neuroscience. He was a founding member of the International Neuroethics Society, uh, which hopefully some of you will go to, their meetings uh, in a couple months, and served as, as its president. Uh, Paul has written over 100 articles on a range of topics regarding the social, religious, ethical, and ideological impact of new sciences and technologies. Indeed, his work ranges across all areas of ethics, but perhaps his coolest post is as the first senior bioethicist at NASA. Uh, for that job, he's going to be going up to the International Space Station to test how zero gravity affects our moral judgments. Right, Paul? Um, it would be kind of cool to do that. In any case, we're very fortunate to have uh, Paul Wolpe here in Atlanta as we aim to make this city a world leader in neuroethics. Well, thanks for that overly generous introduction. Also, I never was actually officially president of the INS. I'm on the executive board. Uh, we didn't have a president. Steve Hyman was president for life. Uh, and then finally, he insisted that he step down. So we will have more presidents in the future. Um, and a word about NASA. Um, yeah, I, I'm, the, uh, I'm the senior bioethics from NASA. I was there yesterday. But um, I want to tell you that as cool as that might sound to you, the person with the coolest title in the United States, maybe in the world, is at NASA. His name was John Rommel. He just retired, and they're appointing a new one. And he was chief of planetary protections. <laughs> How can you do... You know, what do you do, Dad? Well, I protect planets, honey. That's, and that's actually what he did. And to go completely on a tangent, completely irrelevant to anything we're doing here, he did say one thing that really changed my perspective on things. I was talking one day, and I was joking with him about him having the coolest title in the world. And I said, 
And what he does is he makes sure that we don't inoculate other planets with earthbound bacteria, that we don't bring back pathogens and things from other planets if such things exist. And he said to me, I have to, and I was we were talking about the Mars mission, and he said, well, I have to protect the ecosystem of Mars. I went, Mars has an ecosystem? He said, every planet has an ecosystem. I never had the moon, a dead planet? He goes, yeah, it has an ecosystem too, and it, deserve, it has integrity, and we should preserve it to the best we can. I don't know about you, that was a, that was a really interesting observation that has nothing to do with today, but it, it really struck me at the time, and I thought I'd share it with you. So back to today. Um, so the uh, inter now International Neuroethics Society was actually founded in 2006 when a group of 13 people interested in the issue of uh, neuroscience and ethics and social aspects of neuroscience got together at a Silomar to try to see if we could put something together in this field that was really just very, very new at the time, and we didn't know what the parameters of it were. We still don't know what the parameters of it are, but we've at least got a better sense. And we had a suspicion that it was going to be very important, but no idea that it would become as important as it became as quickly as it became. And now, issues of neuroscience have really become some of the most trenchant and important issues that we think about in medical ethics and in the ethics of biotechnology. Many of the issues that we worried about and thought about and many of us wrote about in genetics um, and it, um, still haven't really manifested and already are very true in neuroscience. It's one of the reasons why I got um, interested in neuroethics as a field was, for example, in, in genetics, uh, we were talking about hu human enhancement. Well, when are we actually going to enhance human beings using genetic technology? Another decade, another two decades, another who knows when we're actually going to take that step. But we're already enhancing human beings neurologically today. We were worried about genetic privacy, but we were worried about genetic privacy at a time when, you know, what did it really mean if you, someone had your genome? There was almost nothing they could tell about you that was important or relevant. And yet brain scans were already being... Um, stored in doctor's offices all over the country, and we were beginning to say, well, maybe we can tell, maybe you would much rather have someone have your genome than have your brain scan, and yet there isn't a, even a conversation about something like neurological privacy. So we began to see that many of the issues in genetics, which had millions and millions of dollars funding the ethics of genetic through ELSI and the Human Genome Project, were actually much more true about neuroscience and yet nobody was funding it and therefore very few people were looking at it. So I say that just by way of saying how gratifying it is uh, um, almost just eight years later, this was 2006 when we founded the society, that there's such a, a remarkable interest in this and that, for example, the President's Commission, which we have a representative speaking to us and sitting in our audience, um, has seen this important enough to really spend a number of sessions thinking about the implications of this technology. And for that reason, when I got to Emory, uh, after a few years, we began to talk amongst ourselves here uh, at, in Atlanta. For those of you in Atlanta, I want to make another observation, not necessarily relevant, but tangentially relevant to this. I'm from Philadelphia. I spent most of my career at Penn. Atlanta is the most collaborative city in higher education I have ever seen. From the moment I got here at Emory, Georgia State, Georgia Tech, Morehouse were calling me saying, what can we do together? How can we collaborate together? It was really a beautiful thing. Does not happen in Philadelphia. I'm not sure anyone from Penn in the history of the university has ever said a sentence to anyone from Temple or Drexel. I'm just not sure that's ever happened. But, you know, and it's a wonderful thing. So as we began to see what Georgia State was doing with the higher, all these, these uh, faculty lines and the really um, strong neuroengineering program and with the neuroscience program at Emory and the Center for Ethics where we published the journal, we realized um, that there were a number of different places around the city where people were doing this work and we need to get together, reinforce each other. And so the Atlantic, the uh, Atlanta Neuroethics Consortium was founded. We're still in the, very much in the formative stages. There's still lots of 
opportunities for people to contribute to that. I'm not sure there's anything quite like it anywhere else, at least I haven't heard of anything quite like it anywhere else. So it really is a resource that I encourage people in this region to uh, look into and be part of. We're extremely open to all kinds of ideas and participation. I want to thank Georgia State for hosting this. I want to thank our partners, Georgia Tech and Mercer, and other schools that have been expressed interest in the Atlanta Neuroethics Consortium. And uh, we only hope that it will grow as we move forward. And with that, I want to uh, thank the organizers, thank um, Eddie and the Georgia State group for all the work they've put into it, and introduce Nicole to come up and tell us a little bit more about why this particular conference is important and how it's been conceived. Thanks. Good. That's functioning. OK. So what I, what I really wanted to do and by the way, I'm going to walk, because whenever I talk, I can't stand still. Um, so as soon as I stop, my thoughts stop flowing. So please excuse me for the fact that I'm just going to walk around and talk to you all. I said you all. Um, <clears throat> OK, so, oh, look at that. Huh. OK, that's better. So the Atlanta Neuroethics Consortium had been going for a good couple of years by the time that I got here. I got here about 14 months ago. Um, and I really felt extraordinarily welcome. And like, this is obviously southern hospitality. The fact that uh, at a meeting in October or November last year, I can't quite remember, when the question came up of, well, what sort of event could we sponsor? What sort of event could we organize um, as the first event for the Atlanta Neurotics Consortium that uh, everyone at the meeting just embraced my suggestion of uh, this particular topic? You know, so I spread around the, um, the abstract, spread around the call for papers, and people just liked it. So you know, that was an extremely uh, warm thing for uh, people to do, for a newcomer like me. Um, so first of all, a big thank you to you all uh, for this, for the hospitality. Um, the other thing is, so what I really want to do is I want to tell you a story that sort of spans seven years. Because what sits behind the title of this conference and the abstract, the call for papers, is really seven years of thinking and uh, that have brought me to this particular point. But um, although I'll tell you a story that takes me over seven years, nevertheless, what I hope to make are really three points. One, the relationship between responsibility and mental capacity. It's something that has fascinated me for several years, and so I'll be talking about, a bit about that. Point number two is the way in which looking at neurointerventions, at interventions into the brain, helps us to understand the relationship between responsibility and mental capacity better, or, or at least so I think. The third point that I hope will come out from this introduction to the topic, like why this topic, um, is that there are actually some really important practical and moral issues which need to be tackled urgently, I think. OK, so as so often happens with my presentations, what I'm going to do, uh, because this is a fairly big background in my work is the notion of responsibility. And what you've got over there is version two of my structured taxonomy of responsibility concepts, or at least some of the eight concepts that I've now got. Uh, I'm going to read you a little parable, and I would like you to listen to the way in which the words responsibility are used differently here. Um, and then I'll link it up with other things. So just sit back and listen to how responsibility is being used to mean different things. Smith had always been an exceedingly responsible person, and after years of impeccable service, the cruise line entrusted him with ultimate responsibility over his own ship. And as captain 
of the ship, he had a responsibility to follow strict procedures and he was responsible for the safety of his passengers and crew. And he was responsible only to the board of directors for his decisions. But on his last voyage, he drank himself into a stupor and he was responsible for the loss of his ship and many lives. In court, Smith's defense attorney argued that his transient depression and alcohol were responsible for his misconduct. But the prosecution's medical experts confirmed that he was fully responsible when he started drinking since he was not suffering from depression at that time. Smith should take responsibility for his victim's family's losses, but his employer will probably be held responsible for them as Smith is insolvent and uninsured. Now, there's really only a couple of points I want to make about this. Point one is that I've you know, spent about 15 years obsessing over the word responsibility, which is, which is kind of really obsessive. Um, and what I've tried to do is I've tried to identify precisely what we mean by this word. And what I've arrived at is the idea that, well, it's not really a single concept responsibility, but rather it's a group of concepts which are related in some way. And so trying to also identify the relations that obtain between these concepts is very important. But the second point, um, why I think it should be important for you to know, know about this, relates to what I've got here on the... Um, on this slide. So it seems to me that what we do within the legal system, when somebody commits a crime, we wonder whether we should blame them, whether they're responsible in that sense. Are they blameworthy? Then when we put them on trial, we ask them to be accountable, like take responsibility for your actions. When we punish them, uh, we impose another kind of responsibility, what HLA Hart called liability responsibility onto them. Uh, then when we consider whether or not we should release them back into society, we wonder to ourselves, but is this, is, are they now a responsible person in the virtue sense, in the character sense? So part of the reason for telling you about this, uh, this par reading to you this parable was just to get you to understand the way in which different senses of responsibility seem to be implicated at different stages within the criminal justice system, in my view. But since, uh, since I've played a role here in designing the particular theme. I figure I may as well tell you about my view, right? Um, so here's the next ingredient. And it's got to do with psychology and the mind and compatibilism. So I came at responsibility as a philosopher through the free will and determinism, uh, determinism debate. So that's the debate where people worry that if the world, for instance, uh, operates according to laws of nature, well then maybe there is no such thing as responsibility, you know, because Something like, uh, all of my actions are brought about by the, you know, as a consequence of the operation of the laws of nature. It's not like I designed those laws, laws of nature. And of course, when I came into the world, it's not like I designed myself in any particular way. So I'm just like this you know, kind of program that's been running ever since I was put on this planet. And everything that I do, everything that, that I say, including what I just, just said right now, and everything that you think, like what you thought right now, um, that too was you know, determined. Couldn't have been different or something of the sort. Now. So that's the direction from which I came at responsibility from, but what I actually am is a compatibilist, and here's how I understand compatibilism. I understand compatibilism as a theory which says that responsibility is not about whether you've been caused or something of the sort, but rather whether you have the right kind of psychology, whether you have the right kind of mind. So imagine this, that we build a wall. On one side of the wall, we place all the people that we think are responsible or fully responsible. On the other side, we place all those people who we don't think are fully responsible. And sorry, Eddie, I don't mean to put you on this side. <laughs> um, um, now, what is the feature that, uh, you know, that might explain why we've put children, people who suffer from various mental illnesses, maybe people who are very old, uh, who are now suffering from dementia? What is it about them that separates them, those people from uh, on the other side of the world? if not precisely, they, that they have a different kind of psychology, right? That they have different kinds of mental capacities. So it's in this sense that I'm a compatibilist and that I think that what responsibility is all about is about, in a very big way, uh, about, it's about psychology, it's about minds. And it's within this broad con uh, context that I entered the field of, uh, the field of neural law. So when I entered the field of neurolaw, I had a very, very simple idea, right? And the idea was something like this. Wow, 
to the extent that responsibility is, mental, is a matter of mental capacities, what mental capacities people possess, what if you could use brain scanning technology to try and figure out what mental capacities particular individuals have, what kinds of brains people need to have in order to be fully responsible people. Now, of course, neuroscience isn't anywhere near, nearly sufficiently advanced for us to be able to do this, but hey, you know, it's getting better. And at least if we had an ideal neuroscience, maybe what we could do is maybe we could indeed figure out uh, what the brains of the people on this side of the wall look like in general terms and how they implement the various mental capacities that people need to have in order to be fully responsible, as opposed to how the brains of people on this side look, um, the brains of people who are not fully responsible. What mechanisms is it that those people lack? What mechanisms are damaged? So that's how neuro uh, became something that I got interested in, because I thought, wouldn't it be great if you could just scan people's brains? to figure out whether they indeed are fully responsible or not fully responsible. Now, why might this matter, you ask? Well, if I commit a crime, right, the last thing that I want, probably, um, is to be punished severely. I may very highly likely want to get away with it. So I could, you know, when, when I'm submitted to uh, psychological examinations, I may try to pretend that I'm actually 90 cents short of a dollar. Uh, such that people will say, no, 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 Nicole really is not fully responsible. She's not an agent. Don't hold her responsible. But if you've got a brain scanner that you can put me in, scan my brain and say, look, Nicole, stop pretending. I can see what's in there. <laughs> Puppies, <laughs> butterflies. Uh, I can see what's in there. Um, then that would be epistemically very useful. Now, so what's the next part? of the story. Right, so that's how neuroscientific diagnostic techniques would be useful. And by diagnostic techniques, I mean techniques which we can use to scan people's brains, figure out what's going on, to look at them. There might be structural neuroimaging techniques, there might be functional neuroimaging techniques of different sorts. But then about five years ago, um, I started getting interested in uh, brain interventions. So it's one thing to say, look, we figured out what it is about some people's brains in virtue of which they are not fully responsible for what they do. But of course, if we could figure this out, maybe we could also do something else, namely A, predict who it might be that might be a dangerous person, perhaps. But not just that, maybe we could intervene to, you know, to fix them. Um, and that indeed uh, brings us into the field of neurointerventions. Now, my initial exposure to neurointerventions was through a particular article written by Barry Latzer, whom I tried to get to come to this conference, but unfortunately I couldn't, um, in which he discusses uh, Singleton v. Norris. So the, the article is called Between Madness and Death, the Medicaid to Execute Controversy. And I won't give you a lawyer's uh, account of the case because I'm really bad at doing that. But Charles Laverne Singleton uh, murdered, murdered a lady who ran, the who ran and, owned, and owned the local grocery store. He was put on trial, found guilty, um, and was quite a uh, convincing case that yes, he indeed committed this crime. Subsequently, he was sentenced uh, to capital punishment, to be executed. But as these things go, you know, it's not like people put a bullet to the head of the person who's just been sentenced to capital punishment. These things, procedure means that these cases stretch out. There are appeals, counter-appeals. Um, from, uh, from memory, Singleton spent 25 years on, uh, on death row waiting to be executed. During this period, he developed very florid symptoms of schizophrenia. And, you know, we're not a barbaric state. We don't execute people who are insane. And so one of the, from the philosopher's perspective, one of the questions that came up was, well, okay, so if we don't want to execute somebody who is insane, would it be fine to medicate him to, first of all, restore him to sanity, you know, to make, make him competent for execution, and then pump him full of other drugs to make him dead? Would that be fine? Um, 
that's the topic which Barry Latzer writes about, and Latzer comes out in favor of medicating people to execute them. Now, I was reading through this with my, my colleague, Herman Meinen, in the Netherlands, and to us it was like, what? <laughs> what are you saying? You want to first of all pump one set of drugs to make this guy competent, and then one, another set of drugs to make them dead? Really? Why would anybody do this? Um, what capacities does a person need to have in order to die anyway? You know, if you're going to do that, why do you need to make them competent? Um, and I guess what that then led to is, it, it led to this part here. It led to a particular approach that we started developing to thinking about why it might be that people may need to be made competent for execution. And the idea was this, that look, if what the aim of capital punishment uh, or any sort of punishment were to be was simply to remove someone who is dangerous from society, to protect everybody else, well then indeed, there's no particular reason why you would have to uh, make them competent. It doesn't matter that he's not uh, sane, you can still execute them. If you took the aim to be deterrence, general deterrence, so you were going to execute this person such that others will know, don't do this because you two might be executed. Um, well, in a way, all that you really need to make, make sure is that, is that this person who's about to be executed, you know, sort of sits there looking like maybe they're a little bit afraid or something because that'll, you know, put the fear of God into everyone who's watching. Um, but again, you wouldn't need a great deal of uh, competence. If, however, what you wanted was for them, was something called retribution, well, now the story gets interesting because in order for retribution to occur, depending on what interpretation you adopt, people need to understand that what is going to happen to them is not just mistreatment, that we're going to treat them harshly, right? But that we are going to uh, inflict punishment on them for a crime that they did commit and that this is something that the state does, not as an act of vengeance, but as, you know, giving them their just deserts or something of that sort. Now think of it. To do that, you need to have the person remember what it is that they did, uh, be able to understand that what's happening to them right now is something that is being inflicted on them by the state uh, for a crime that they committed, and this is just punishment. I mean, that's a lot of competence that you need to have if that's how you interpret the aim of retribution. So, the more we thought about it, the more we realized that, yes, there's a lot, um, there might be a lot to the article that um, Barry Latzer wrote, and that these might be some of the reasons why we might wonder about what sorts of capacities a person may need to have in order to be fit for execution. Now, I personally do not endorse execution as a form of punishment. Some people do, though, and so I can't substitute my own judgments for a political uh, view. And if what we say as a society is that capital punishment is something that we do, well then, we need to address these questions. Is it, you know, well, what capacities does a person need to have, given that there are plural aims of punishment? One of these aims might even be rehabilitation or reform. Well, I mean, there won't be much rehabilitation or reform if you kill someone, but perhaps when you put people into prison, if, if what you want to do is to rehabilitate them, well, maybe we need to give them a leg up. Maybe they lack the capacity to be re-educated, to learn. So maybe we need to give them certain medications that will make it possible for them to learn. So there are lots, of, lots and lots of reasons to think about uh, this question of what capacities does a person need to have. The more we thought about it, the more we also realized that the same kind of approach might be uh, used. So this sort of approach where we ask, well, what aim is it that we're trying to serve? Retribution, deterrence, incapacitation, reform, and so on and so forth. Um, at the, uh, at the trial phase and at the release phase. So what mental capacities does a person need to have in order to be fit for trial? Well, that depends on what it is that, that we think people need to do at trial. What mental capacities does a person need to have in order to be fit for release? Well, again, it depends on what, what it is that we think they need, to, uh, they need to be. If what we think that they need to be is a fully responsible moral, moral agent, well then, maybe we need to uh, give them certain medications to make them fully responsible moral agents. If we also think that they should be uh, safe, then maybe we should install some special keeper which will prevent them from doing certain unsafe things. Who knows? I'm just reporting, not endorsing any of this, right? So, um, the main point that I want to make about 
these three stages, so the, you know, the question of what capacities does a person need to have for trial, for punishment, and for release, and neurointerventions is simply that we might use neurointerventions to restore the capacities that we think people need to have. And my interest here is in the relationship between responsibility in the different senses that you've got above there, like accountability, liability, the virtue sense, and the mental traits that people allegedly need to have, and how we might use neurointerventions, perhaps chemicals, to restore them. Now, but I've got this other thing here, enhancement. What's that all about? So that's the third part, well, the fourth part of the conference. So there are really three parts, right? The conference is divided into uh, neurointerventions in three parts of the criminal law, and then there's this neurointerventions and cognitive enhancement. The idea there is that of late, a range of different medications like Ritalin, like Modafinil, um, have started to be used by people not just to treat mental disorders like attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, or shift work sleep disorder, but rather for alleged cognitive enhancement purposes, to make yourself smarter, to bring it, make yourself more awake, to help you learn better. Um, and this has raised concerns from some people who say, hey, if I happen to be a student here at Georgia State, and I'm not taking this medication, where somebody else is, in fact, I, I remember thinking this uh, uh, with my students in the neural law class that I, thought, that I was teaching. I thought, hmm, what if some of them are taking cognitive enhancement medications and those medications make it possible for them to write better essays as a consequence of which they get the really good grades, much better grades, and in fact they inflate my uh, grading standard. Wouldn't it be sort of unfair that these other students don't get this advantage? And indeed, what you find is that at some universities, Duke in fact, uh, there is a very explicit policy against the use of uh, these medications for cognitive enhancement purposes. You know, so at Duke, this is treated as a, uh, as a uh, breach of academic integrity, not dissimilar to uh, plagiarism. You know, there it is, next to uh, plagiarism, listed as a breach of academic integrity. So some people say that actually we should regulate, the law should regulate, um, access to cognitive enhancement medications because it might be unfair. We should prohibit some people from taking them. But flip this on its head. Rather than telling people that they can't, take, that can't and shouldn't take cognitive enhancement medications, there is a different and I think more interesting question. Maybe some people, in virtue of what they do, of the important things that they do during the, you know, during, in the professions, like for instance, say somebody who's a surgeon, maybe they're about to perform a very, very long operation that lasts you know, the whole day. And they know that, this, that as they go on through the day, they're going to get more and more tired. They'll start zoning out. They won't be able to focus as well. Well, suppose that there were this medication that you could take, which would keep you awake, ensure that you can stay focused, on mind on the job, that you won't not notice that critical place and cut through it and result in a person who's either crippled or a person who's dead. If this medication had either no side effects or very mild side effects, Mightn't there be a reason to say that actually maybe the surgeon has a responsibility to enhance themselves under some circumstances? Suppose that you're a judge and you are, you know, you've, you're now listening to yet another case. You've been sitting there for a long time. People's lives depend upon your decisions. You don't want to be getting tired and zoning out as you're listening uh, to the arguments. You want to be really with it. Perhaps judges have a responsibility to take cognitive enhancers when uh, they sit in on cases, not endorsing, just reporting. Um, now, so that's one possibility, uh, poss possible way in which this particular brain intervention interacts with responsibility. Do people have a responsibility to enhance themselves? But here's another one. As I mentioned early on in uh, this introduction, in this introductory talk, my interest is in the relationship between responsibility and mental capacity, right? And the basic idea that I've always had is that What's this relationship? Well, responsibility tracks mental capacity. Um, as mental capacity uh, goes up, once it reaches a certain stage, people are fully responsible. As it drops, perhaps due to mental illness, if it drops below the threshold, uh, they're no longer fully responsible individuals. Well, if that's the kind of relationship 
that we have between responsibility and mental capacity, what would happen to all those people who do indeed pop their pills, you know, because they want to make sure that they do the right thing, uh, maybe they're the enhanced surgeon or the enhanced judge? Well, now that they've got Superman-like skills, uh, is it the case that with uh, great power comes great responsibility, that now they have greater responsibilities? Is it reasonable to expect more of them now that they've enhanced themselves? Um, would it be reasonable? Well, it seems like um, if capacitarianism is true, if this claim that there is this relationship between responsibility and mental capacity, um, if that is true, well then maybe when people enhance themselves, maybe they should indeed acquire new responsibilities. Now, so on this latter story that I've told, it's not that we should prohibit people, that the law should prohibit people from having access to cognitive enhancement medications, but rather that on some occasions uh, we should make it a responsibility to enhance yourself. But how does all of this mesh together in this particular conference? So, there are indeed these four different domains, three of which are within the domain of the criminal law, where we use neurointerventions. And one of the things that I would like you to think about as you go to the papers, as you listen to the discussions, is how it is that these discussions might shed light on whether or not you think that it is indeed the case that responsibility tracks mental capacity. That's one thing. Because if you find that you don't want to say yes with greater mental capacities, should come greater responsibility. If you feel like, no, nah, that'd be the wrong thing to say, that we should now expect more of judges. Now that they've done the right thing and taken and popped their pill, they're cognitively enhanced, we should expect more of them. If you think that's not the case, well then maybe what you're doing is maybe you're doubting this fairly basic principle which Nicole Vincent has endorsed for a little while. Um, and if you reckon that's a good, there's a good reason to doubt this principle, well then tell me, because um, I want to know. Uh, another way in which I expect these discussions to be of interest conceptually, at the conceptual level, um, is that if what, suppose for instance, in thinking about what capacities a person might need to have to be punished for the sake of retribution, you realize that, well, look, here's what I would need to do to this person. I would need to make it possible for them to feel a certain kind of fear as a consequence of the fact that they're about to be executed. And to understand that, this, uh, that what is about to be done to them is a consequence of something that they themselves did. So in a way, they've brought this upon themselves such that they can feel agent regret or something of the sort. And now that what you're going to do is to say, hmm, I'm going to make it possible for this person to feel that by giving them certain medications, if we had those medications. Now, if you have doubts about whether or not that would be the right thing to do, to restore a person, to restore or to implant in them the right sorts of capacities such that they can be punished for the sake of retribution. Well then, I wonder whether you wouldn't, this wouldn't give you reason to say that when it comes to holding people responsible in this liability responsibility sense, um, maybe you no longer endorse the claim that uh, retribution should occur. That retribution is a justified reason uh, a justified aim of holding people responsible. And I think that'd be kind of interesting again, because it would, sh it would shed light upon uh, what we think it means and why we think it matters that we end up holding people responsible. So, um, to very quickly wrap up. So, The structure of this conference has been ar arranged around these four, four different sections, as I keep mentioning. And what we've done with what we've done in designing the program is we thought, look, first of all, let's have panels, panel discussions where a particular case will be presented, whether the case has to do with uh, going to trial, being punished, or being released back into society post-incarceration. The case will be presented and then several commentators will just speak for about five minutes to give you their disciplinary perspective on what they think ought to be said about that particular case. Now, why do that? Part of the reason is that we would like you to a, get exposure to an interdisciplinary discussion, right? So here's this particular case. This stuff happened some time ago. 
Uh, but then to, to hear how it is that scientists, medical practitioners, philosophers, legal folk, what they think about this case. Now, hopefully, after the, uh, after the panelists have had their five minutes, there'll still be enough time for you then to engage in the discussion. Now, why do that? Part of the reason for the, doing that is to prime you for the parallel sessions that follow, so that when you go into the talks, you might be a philosopher, but you'll think, wow, I just heard something really interesting, a scientist's perspective, and I reckon that this thing bears on the paper that I'm now listening to in the following way. And so you perhaps can end up asking, uh, as a philosopher, a scientific question, or maybe you can engage in, uh, in a scientist's presentation. So, up to the panels, we will indeed have the talks, uh, and what we hope is that uh, you'll come to these talks bringing a, the particular background uh, that we hope you'll develop by participating in the discussion up to the panels. Now, we've also got some fantastic posters uh, at reception where we're showcasing some exciting new work. So what I would invite you to do is to head across to the posters uh, that will be this evening at reception. Talk to the people who are presenting these posters. Maybe provide them with some advice. Maybe learn from them. Finally, we've also got some fantastic keynotes. We've got judges here. I mean, I reckon that's really awesome. That's particularly super. And some really good headlined participants who are all leading figures uh, in this particular field. And they're going to both share the wisdom with us, and also we're going to have their input uh, in the context of discussions um, at these panels and in various papers. Now, so that's sort of the basic conceptual background for, the, uh, for this conference. You know, so what I would like you to do is to think about how it is that thinking about neurointerventions sheds light on your understanding of the relationship between responsibility and the mind. Um, and I would also like you to pay attention to the fact that these are very important, urgent questions. They're not just you know, philosophers' uh, made-up stories. Real people have been put to death. Um, real people are involved in the administration of uh, medications to make people competent for punishment, competent for execution. Uh, these are live issues. Real people are administered um, antiandrogens to make them safe for release. Last comment. I really personally would like to thank uh, the student assistants um, who are going to be, well, who've been sitting out there at the registration desk welcoming you, and who also be, who will get to meet at the various breakout rooms for the parallel sessions. Um, as well as Claire Coy, uh, with whom many of you may have spoken uh, in the context of coming here, asking for information. And in particular, I would like to thank Stephanie Hare. Where are you, Stephanie? Stephanie? Where? She's outside. Oh, that's right. So she's helping, and rather than listening to her advisor. Um, so if it weren't for Stephanie, uh, I would have been in quite a lot of trouble. Stephanie has made sure that uh, all that this whole conference was possible by taking care of lots and lots and lots of details and keeping on me and saying, Nicole, give me that information. So without further ado, uh, what I'm now going to do is I'm now going to introduce the next uh, session. Well, first of all, I'll say the conference is now open. Welcome. Um, and then I'll introduce uh, people who are kicking off this conference, namely Chris Ryan and Katrina Sifford, who are going to chair the presentation, um, the, the first panel. Please come up. <laughs>